Yeah, hi. Nice to see you here. Um, it's been an interesting year in the Phoenix gaming industry. We have seen several game companies doing initial public offerings and, and listing uh, in the stock exchange. And we have two experts here uh, who've gone through, through the process now. So it's really interesting to kind of hear, hear your views on, um, on how, it, how it was and, 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 and some of the, the backgrounds and, and, and why, why uh, it's been happening right now. Uh, I, I guess we could kind of start with the, with the why, the timing, because it's, uh, it seems like, well, Tim, you, you were the first. Uh, you listed in, in March this yep. year in the, in the first North. Um, so kind of what prompted the, the timing and the decision uh, now? Sure. Um, this might take a few minutes. So <laughs> um, we actually have to go back to, you know, early 2016 when I believe that strong companies have three things in place. So you need, need to have your core values in place, your mission and vision, like why the company exists, where you're headed to, and then your strategy in place. And we at Next Games, like we put a lot of time in, in making sure that those three things are in place. And we had a very clear idea on how the, we want to grow the company and how much money is needed uh, to do that. And uh, we were looking at different options. The, the existing in investors were interested in, in financing the, the strategy, uh, multiple you know, VCs, uh, we're interested, but you know, it's just like one of those days when you thought about what, what about an IPO? Like nobody has done that before. Like is that an option? And we started to explore what it means for the company, and uh, it, it took quite a few months to figure out whether it, you know it, it, it makes sense or not. But you know, at the end, end we we kind of like came to a conclusion that it gives so much more than just the money, you know, the, the visibility and all the other stuff you get with the IPO that it makes sense. Uh, obviously, after that, you have to talk to uh, different banks, whether, you know, whether there's any interest from the uh, <laughs> banks to organize yeah. the IPO to get that done. And then you talk to the market and so forth. So it took quite a few months, but uh, uh, it was by far the best option for us. So the timing came from the, the needs of, of our company. We, we were not looking at, you know, that the market is now open and we, we should do it now, vice versa. Like, it was just the best option from, from multiple different options. And, and so the decision came from the leadership of the company? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so, so Tero, uh, you the kind of the same question. Remedy has been a strong company for 20 years. It's one of the oldest companies in Finland. Um, uh, so why now? What, what was your kind of reasoning behind the, the timing? I think uh, Temu summarized it well. It is related to timing, but not the timing as people typically see it, how the market is going. It's definitely related to strategy. Those of you not familiar, Remedy has been around for 22 years, developing console and PC games. That's our focus. And uh, kind of like for 20 years, it continued without uh, outside financing. But in a way, when the company matures, people mature, ambition starts to rise. And uh, our latest game, Quantum Break, was uh, about to be finished uh, about two years ago. And that was also the moment when the, uh, we at management, we had the possibility again to sit down and start considering where to head next. What's the next direction for the company? And uh, having done the similar type of business, uh, developing one in a way AAA game, major game, really ambitious game creatively, but just one game at the time for, for 15, 20 years, clearly kind of like the, the senior level people uh, were all saying that with, with the amount of talent that we have, there is so much more we can achieve, both creatively and business-wise. And that was the moment when we started drafting our new strategy which was uh, much more ambitious, as I said, not just creatively, but business-wise. And when we had the strategy in place, uh, we thought that, yes, it is realistic, it is doable, it requires a lot, and one of the elements it needed was, was more funding. We have been financially uh, very healthy, but in a way, 
investing in the future growth that involves more risk, we also wanted to have more backup. Not to be in a situation that we, we invest in, into our growth and then six, 12 months later we realize that things haven't gone exactly as planned and now our bank account is looking uh, really bad. So we knew that yes, we will need some money to invest into our growth, but we also wanted to have the backup that even though we would have the money, we would have the safety, the, the, the safety that uh, yeah. if something gets delayed, we can still go forward and the strategic timing, we needed it and that was the driving force behind our listing. Yeah, so, but it was not just about the raising the money, it was also like having the liquidity, I mean, rewarding the staff as well and, and this kind of considerations, I, I suppose. Um, yeah, sure, but the... I think our IPO was a bit different because like none of the uh, existing you know founders or investors sold anything you know vice versa in, in fact so uh, all the money was raised to grow the company of, of course like for the um, employees it's it's uh, a special occasion because you can see your options actually that they mean something if yeah. you exercise your you know options so you know of course that's a great retention tool and works well when you're recruiting new people as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, and, and uh, if, I, if I may add, that was a good question, that it's uh, not just about liquidity and raising money. That's, that's of course, that's one part. But many of you in the audience, you may have the startup or you may have a bit later stage company. You have given out the options and ownership for the people. But when that, that continues for five or ten years, and uh, people start in a way, they see that they have some ownership, they have some options, but if the amount still are not that significant that they will lock those people, some of those people will after 10 or 5 or 10 years start considering that do my options, do my shares really have some value? And what we saw when we got listed that people, kind of like almost uh, all of our people either had direct ownership or they had options, they, in a way, finally, they saw a clear value in their ownership. And what happened, that none of them wanted to sell them at that point, but they wanted to keep it. And it has clearly given a new, I would say, motivational boost for our people as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so still a bit more about the, the kind of starting point and the process. I mean, uh, Dem, you had raised r funding rounds. Uh, yeah, yeah. How we, many we, rounds did you have? We had two, well, three if you include seed. So Series A was 8 million USD and Series B was 10 million USD. So 18 million altogether. Yeah, yeah. And, and you said, you know, the process, like you, it, it took months to prepare. Uh, how, how long was there your, your process? Or when did you actually kind of start? I would, say, I would say six months. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you have to, like, uh, hire somebody for the process? You... you um, like personnel, or, or you were running it um, with, the, with the crew that you had? Well, you, you have to like, uh, hire advisors. So you need the bank, first of all, who's yeah. issuing the IPO. Then you need uh, legal advice. So you need lawyers. Then uh, you need you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers or whoever you're using for you know, your accounting <laughs> and auditing that. And then... Um, we had a PR agency, so we had quite a few people involved, yeah. but we, we did not hire anyone uh, to work for Next Games just because of the IPO. So, and e even now, like, we still haven't hired anyone because we went public. Like, the company's growing, and the people that we've hired would have been needed like anyhow. So, yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Um, uh, so you, you both listed on the first North. Was, that, was there a discussion on, like, on the list? Like, who, who decided where would you list the company? Well, uh, for us, uh, the main need was to raise capital to fuel our growth. So we actually did uh, evaluate the different options. There are financial institutions providing loan, kind of like for the game industry needs. Uh, that wasn't uh, enough by itself. Uh, that's, that's potential one element. Then we had the VC money as one option. Our background was a bit different because the company was uh, fully privately owned in a sense that it was uh, just the management and employees that owned the company. 
and uh, many of us had experiences from the VCs, uh, most of them really positive ones, but still having this type of ownership uh, structure, the idea of getting a VC on board with all those veto rights and preferences and others, uh, we considered that uh, we would not like to go that route, and then there was the listing option. And uh, First North, in a way, people easily see uh, the public listing as, as it was traditionally five or ten years ago with a lot of regulations. There are still are regulations, there are requirements, but in the First North market, they are much more limited. And uh, it, yeah. was, it was a bit easier process, but especially now afterwards, it has been much easier than it most likely would have been had we gone directly to the main list. Yeah. So, so how is the time after? Like, are there any unseen side effects or regrets, or why would you not recommend IPO to somebody? Um. I would say vice versa. I, I think it's been been great. You you kind of have to think about the the afterlife well before you do the IPO. So, we we tried to make sure that nothing would come as a surprise. Like, I think the um, maybe the only thing that. Uh, not bothers me, but kind of surprised because we were the first company to go public and we had to translate the terms you use in, in games business in Finnish. Like you use DAU and then it's aktiiviset päivittäiset käyttäjät and you know, all that stuff. So you kind of like the communicating about your business is different when you use your native language Finnish. So that's, that's something that you have to learn again because obviously you've been doing it in, in English, like half of our employees are no, not from Finland and so forth, so English is like the language you use for, for, for work, so that's new, that you need to <laughs> use Finnish more nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think we had been around for such a long time uh, that, for example, our finance, uh, finance processes were already in order. Uh, nothing has changed in that sense that we are doing a good reporting anyway. So we didn't need to do that. Um, maybe, the, maybe the kind of like one thing that, of course, we are transparent within the company, but uh, when you are publicly listed, you need to treat all the potential shareholders equally. So we cannot kind of like publicly anymore speculate that much that if our game is coming out, how amazing it's going to be yeah. and how may actually, how much it might sell. This type of things we have to keep to ourselves uh, within the company in the, in the, in the planning phases. Uh, one big, you know, a positive thing that we didn't expect would come is that, of course, gaming industry is growing. We are all fighting for talent, trying to recruit people. Uh, over 40% of our employees come outside of Finland, so we have active recruitment campaigns going on both in Europe, Asia and uh, US. And uh, the latest people that have arrived, that we have attracted from abroad, they have said that now Remedy, having its kind of like uh, really great history, uh, uh, being an independent company and being publicly listed, that they see that as a great strength. Maybe because yeah. in the console gaming industry there have been studio closers, and and uh, that gives some sort of credibility, at least from people coming from certain parts of the world. Yeah, I, I think Tero had a good point about uh, communication. So once you go public and even to uh, during the process, you really have to think about what the company is doing and why you're doing those decisions and now once you're public you w when you talk about you know your future plans or upcoming games whatever you really have to think about how you say it and what you promise and 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 that process really makes you think hard like you know are, are we doing the right thing so it it kind of like puts a bit more structure for for the business and decision making also yeah, yeah, that's especially for the kind of external communication. Yeah. How about internally? Has the, the, I don't, the creative culture or, or the way of working, has it, has it changed at all? No, not really. Like, it, it really doesn't change that much. Uh, of course, like, you know, s some of the, the topics you can't share like you used to with, with all your employees unless, you know, you, like Tero said, all the shareholders need to know certain things. But other than that, I think it's business as usual. Yeah, has the like the, the expectations from the kind of post IPO investors been different than from the pre IPO investors? Like expectations for growth, or you know, are you seeing you know different kind of demands or 
Well, <laughs> it's funny. Like I, I think nowadays we can actually manage those expectations more than before, because we had like uh, mainly our investors come from the U.S. and their uh, VC companies or, and media companies, and of course they had like their own vision on how fast the company could grow, and and not not demands but expectations. But now we as a public company, we we let to let to um, we can tell our investors like what we are aiming for, yeah. and and as a company again we are not giving financial targets. We are saying that how many games, for example, we're going to launch per year. So it, it's actually a bit more pleasant in, in this current situ situation versus like before. Yeah. But that's yeah. that's a that's in a sense a good question because. Uh, Maybe you need to be in a certain phase uh, to go public. Uh, at least, that in a way, the vision for the company, the key strategic pillars on which you are building your growth, those have to be clear enough. Because clearly what the investors, be they in a way retail investors, private investors or institutions, they in a way, they, they, they want to see certain, certain stability in the strategy. They want to understand where the company is heading and kind of like uh, how it's aiming to do that. And definitely they don't want to see that changing every three months time or every six months time. And in a way, if you are consistent in your communication and you are following your strategy, it goes well. Then in a way, if you are doing some changes, which always happen, I've seen so far, of course, we haven't yet faced a situation where we would have done a, a, a big change, but, but then you simply need to reason it. You need to give those whys why you are doing those. And I have seen that in order to clarify some of our messaging for people coming outside of game industry, it's, it's actually been quite refreshing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I have to say that, you know, as a, as a gaming entrepreneur myself, with a bit smaller company at the moment, um, it, it's been a refreshing to see in the industry, the, the, the kind of uh, IPOs. It's, it's like a fresh breath of air in a way, like mm. we have grown up in, in some sense. Do, do you see like any industry-wide reactions or, or changes? Like, is, is, the, is the industry grown up now in a way? <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. Like, I think it has been a boost for the whole industry because, you know, obviously this is something that hasn't been done before. And in one year, like you said, four or five uh, listings. So it, it's kind of another path for companies now to uh, make their growth happen. It used to be just like VC money before. And of course, you need it still. But, you know, it's kind of another way to do it. And uh, I think it, it's not just gaming that got like the, the fresh breath of air. It's also all the other startups in Finland, in my opinion, that can now think about you know the option of going public and and you can already see it in the media all the uh, you know Kauppalehti and th these magazines are writing uh, speculating like which one of, of, of the, all the all the fine startups in Finland might be doing the listing next so yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely uh, the industry has been maturing for a long time this is a very concrete sign of that uh, but, but, but if we take a kind of like bit longer term view and go back to the history, in a way, overall, uh, Finnish gaming industry, I remember I started in 2002, back then there were only maybe 200 people in the gaming industry here, and, and uh, already at that time, kind of like both the press and the kind of like government institutions, they regarded gaming industry very positively. I remember, for example, Tekes, the government uh, funding agency for, for, for technology, they were maybe the biggest visionaries out of us all. They were saying that gaming industry can be, be become a huge industry for Finland. And us entrepreneurs were thinking that what, that, what, what have these guys taken? That, that, they had, in a way, more belief, yeah. maybe, than we had. But already back then, they were saying that in order for a healthy ecosystem uh, to be built, it needs to be a pyramid, that you have a lot of small companies on the bottom, and then you have the medium-sized layer, and then you have some of those signing stars. And then those signing stars eventually came. It was Rovio and Supercell. But there wasn't this middle layer, at least not that clear one. And now clearly kind of like we are showing some examples for the wider public and there are, I think, something bubbling under that might, might happen next year or year after that. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a few more minutes. So, and last, I would like to, to explore a little bit about the future. So, so how do you see uh, your company is going to the future and what's the kind of next focus areas? And I must say, I, I heard that you've both been mentioning M&A activities. Anything you can share that? Is there any, any, any concrete plans yet? Uh, you know, what kind of companies you might be, might be looking at or anything? Well, um, I would say for, for us, it's about executing the strategy. The, the one we had even before the IPO and, and really the one that we're ex executing now. So it's, it's more about operational stuff that we're focusing on now, like we're a games company and, and our job is to launch good games. So that's what we, we're going to be focusing on. And uh, regarding potential m and um, so far we've bought two companies, uh, Lume Games, uh, earlier this year. Uh, a terrific company like works on AR and location-based stuff. And earlier in 2014, we bought Helsinki Gameworks. So we've done acquisitions, but I don't think this, even though it's very cozy here, but I don't, I don't think I should be <laughs> speculating about you know, any other potential M&As yeah, yeah. other yeah. than obviously it's, it's it, always it could an happen. agenda. It, it, yeah. It's always an option. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, have been, we have been so far growing organically, and uh, that's still at least for now on our focus. We think that... Uh, there is a clear plan and you always need to, of course, have the longer term vision where you are heading at, but still make sure that you are implementing the one or two year strategy correctly. And I think in both of our business, you know that uh, you are typically only as good as your latest game is. And we have to make that sure in this transition phase. And uh, at that point, it means uh, growing organically. Yes, yes. Um. Yeah, that is uh, that is kind of a um, difference in the gaming industry that there is this fluctuation in, in like you're very project dependent. Um, yeah, so you have to be aware of that. Um, I think we have a, <laughs> a little bit more time. I, no, do, you, do you have any final uh, comments you want to say? Any tips for the budding entrepreneurs for how to build a, a strong company? <laughs> well, I, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, but you know, if you're contemplating a, a possible IPO, like just make sure your strategy is in place. You can explain why you need the money if you're raising money and, and ha just have a good plan for it. Like, and then, then it's definitely an option among like all the other like in investment opportunities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The IPO in itself doesn't require anything more than you have systematically developed a good company that's heading into a clear direction and then you may have, in a way, the different options for exit or different options for the additional funding. And, and uh, going public is it's, it's just, in a way, one step on that route. And uh, then doing it technically or practically, as, as Temu said, you will anyway need uh, good advisors and they, will, they can guide you how to do it. Yes. Thank you. It's been, it's been great to chat with you and, and thank you for all the insights. Um, uh, it's, it's very good to have this uh, market opening, opening on the gaming industry. It'll make the Finnish industry even stronger. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>